Revelation 4. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard first speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also, in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around even under its wings. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives for ever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives for ever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Well, few, if any of us, will ever have the privilege of a vision like John's. In fact, I don't believe anyone ever has since. What we have here is a glimpse behind the scenes of something hidden, but revealed to John as he is taken through the door in heaven. A glimpse into heaven itself, an impression at least of the glory of God. And I say impression deliberately because John at times is struggling to describe what he sees. With phrases like the appearance of, what looked like and was like. And much of what he sees is very strange and otherworldly. And to make things more complicated for us, we know that some at least of what he describes is meant to be taken uh, symbolically. We've seen that already in chapter one with the lampstands and the stars and other features of the vision of Christ. And we know for sure in the next chapter that the lamb that we see there is not a literal lamb but has to be a symbol of Christ. Of course some have seen uh, visions similar to this one. Notably Isaiah in chapter 6 had a startling and awesome vision of God in the temple and some aspects of that vision are very similar to this one. And perhaps less well known is Ezekiel's vision which he had whilst he was in exile in Babylon. And his vision of God was again very similar in many ways with this vision in Revelation. And it's worth reading both of those two if you have time. And these visions are surely recorded to lift our eyes to heaven, to gain an impression of the glory and majesty and power of God. So in this John's vision, the throne is very much at the centre and the Lord God Almighty is seated upon, upon it. And so we've got a schematic diagram here uh, on the screen of the vision that he saw. In the centre is the throne of the Lord God Almighty. And around the throne are the four living creatures and immediately in front of the throne, there are seven blazing lamps. 
and a sea of glass. And around the throne are the 24 elders, each seated on a throne. And as the vision proceeds into chapter five, we'll see that the throne is further surrounded by thousands upon thousands of angels. I'm going to take us through uh, the components of the vision and then stand back to consider our response to what we are seeing. So first, the heavenly throne in verse two. The throne is what John sees first of all, and it's the ultimate, most important aspect of the vision. And hopefully that diagram there uh, helps to reinforce the centrality of the throne. It's at the centre because the one who's seated on it is the primary focus of the vision. The word throne is not only central to this passage, but to the whole book of Revelation. Of the 62 occurrences of the word throne in the New Testament, 47 of them occur in Revelation. And the theme of the throne of God is found throughout scripture so that the psalmist could say God is king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. And when Isaiah had his vision, he said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and his train filled the temple. And the throne speaks to us of God's absolute, sovereign, kingly power. He has supreme control and authority. He is high and exalted. And that throne is at the centre of this vision. But John goes on to describe the scene further. And we might have expected really a detailed description of the one seated on the throne itself. But John resolutely refuses to describe the appearance of God. Instead, he gives an impression which is brief and uh, enigmatic. Beautiful jewels of jasper and carnelian are used to describe his appearance. I don't know whether you're familiar uh, with those particular jewels. Most of us probably don't own uh, beautiful jewels. I certainly don't. But when we see them in the shop window or on antiques roadshow or whatever, there's often an intake of breath as we wonder at their beauty and their value. And we're also told uh, that there is a rainbow resembling an emerald that encircles the throne. I don't know about you, but whenever uh, we're on a walk and we see a rainbow, we have to stop, we have to look at it, and usually if we've got the camera with us, we have to try and capture its beauty uh, with the camera. And you can see on the screen there a picture of Sue, that's at uh, Niagara. And this rainbow around the throne is said to be emerald. I can't quite picture it. Can you picture an emerald rainbow? But the, these are evocative images and they're meant to evoke a sense of brilliance, of splendour, of majesty and above all of beauty. And the brilliance of what is seen irradiates to all around. The one who is on the throne is supreme in his dazzling beauty. Then the vision opens up uh, a little to reveal 24 elders, each seated on their own throne. But this is no uh, game of thrones. There's no doubt that the central throne is supreme. And we see this when the elders fall down and lay their crowns before the supreme throne at the center. But who are these 24 elders? Well, many see them as in some way representative of God's people from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Elders is a term used of leaders both, both in the Old and in the New Testament. And 24 may be a combination of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. 
certainly when we come to the vision of the new Jerusalem in chapter 21, the foundations of 12 apostles and the gates have the names of the 12 tribes. Some have suggested that the 24 is in fact a reference to the 24 priestly divisions uh, found in 1 Chronicles 24. You'd have to uh, read that chapter for yourself. And these 24 elders are then the counterpart in heaven to the priests in the temple on earth. But both these views have in common that the 24 represent in some way God's people. After all, believers are called a kingdom of priests in Revelation. And these 24 elders are seated on thrones and have crowns on their heads. There is definitely a sense of royalty about them. And they have white robes, presumably representing their purity, but also white robes are priestly garments. So hence a kingdom of priests. And of course, Paul tells us in Ephesians that God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. So these elders represent the people of God worshipping on earth represented as a kingdom of priests in heaven. In the future, when Christ returns, the intimacy of the 24 elders worship will be that of each one of us. And then we have the thunder and the lightning of verse five. Perhaps until this point, we might have thought that this uh, is a tranquil scene, but thunder and lightning inspire awe and uh, often fear. When we were in the uh, Black Forest on holiday back in August, we experienced a number of thunderstorms and usually we were in a, a building or in, in the car. But when you're caught out in the open, you run for shelter as quickly as possible as we did. And when God appeared in a cloud on Mount, Mount Sinai, there, there was thunder and lightning and everyone trembled at what they heard and saw. And there's a sense here of the unapproachable light, which Paul speaks of in 1 Timothy 6.15. God blessed uh, God, the blessed and only ruler, a king of kings, lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. And we have a sense here of God's awesome and fearful presence, because our God is a consuming fire. And we as fallen sinful creatures dare not enter into his presence. And yet paradoxically, if the 24 elders represent believers, we are in his presence. Of course, this is only possible through the blood of the lamb. And chapter four is only half of the vision of this throne room. We've still got more to be uh, revealed next time. But thunder and lightning reminds us that we're to come to God uh, with reverence and awe. And then we are told that there are seven lamps and a sea of glass. Now the seven lamps, we're told, represent the seven spirits of God, which is the Holy Spirit, seven representing his uh, perfection. And just as the 24 elders uh, may have had their priestly counterpart in the temple, so do these seven lamps, because of course there were seven burning lamps standing in front of the Holy of Holies. The tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament in some way represented heaven, and the articles in, in the temple represented these heavenly things that we're seeing here. And that points, I think, to the meaning of this sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the temple there was a basin for priests to to wash in. We're told about it in Exodus chapter 30 and then later uh, in the temple this was called a, a sea in 1 Kings 7 23 and 2 Chronicles uh, 4 2 to 5. And the counterpart in heaven appears to be this sky-like pavement uh, which we read of in Exodus 24 and the crystal expanse which Ezekiel saw in his vision. 
So in this vision, the, there is this connection with the earthly temple. And that highlights to us the fact that this is the ultimate place of worship. And worship is now what is described. Because we come to the four living creatures who surround the throne. And they're first in the chain of worship. And these four living creatures are similar, though not identical, to the creatures that Ezekiel saw under the throne of God. Four creatures were seen by uh, both. They have the same faces, a lion, ox, man and eagle. But in Ezekiel, each creature seems to have all four faces. In both visions, they're covered with eyes and they have wings, all those four in Ezekiel and six in Revelation. And in Ezekiel, they're identified as cherubim, the creatures carved onto the seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And the psalmist declares that the Lord Almighty is enthroned between the cherubim. So again, we see temple imagery with its counterpart in heaven. And these cherubim with their faces of created beings with the name living creatures may represent the living creation. Animals, both wild and domesticated, birds and man himself. Or they may be one of the highest orders of angelic beings, their faces representing strength and service and knowledge and swiftness. But whoever they are and whatever they're supposed to represent, far more important is their function. They appear to lead the worship in heaven ceaselessly, day and night. They give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne. And so we have the first song of Revelation. Three times God's holiness, holy, 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 is proclaimed, just as the seraphim in Isaiah's vision. And double repetition would add emphasis, but triple repetition indicates the superlative and all-surpassing holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord Almighty is a common name of God in the Old Testament. It's what the seraphim call him in Isaiah 6.3. And the Hebrew there is Yahweh Sebaoth. Yahweh of the armies, commander of the armies of heaven. It emphasizes his power and might over all creation. So that translation almighty or pantocrator in, in the Greek seems appropriate. The almighty one, his supreme power is declared by his name. Who is, sorry, who was and who is and who is to come. The eternal one. The great I am revealed to Moses, the ancient of days seen by Daniel, the one who lives forever and ever, whose power extends across time. And so they proclaim God's superlative holiness, his omnipotence over all creation and his eternal nature, no beginning nor end. And so the 24 elders respond on hearing this acclamation the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they lay their crowns before him in worship and we hear the second song of revelation you are worthy our lord and god to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being they declare his worth because he is the creator of all things. He's worthy of glory and honour and power. And his greatness and his power is displayed in the whole of creation. The stars, the planets, the land and the seas, the life of this planet, the plants, the animal, man, mankind itself. Every molecule and atom has its existence due to God's power. It's a power beyond our imagination, a knowledge beyond our thinking. And this is our God, holy, omnipotent, 
eternal, the creator of all things. And we haven't even begun to think of the, the lamb and God's plan of redemption, which is the focus of the, the next chapter. So what should be our response to a vision like this? Well, what we have, at least in part, in the book of Revelation is a worship book. If the Psalms are the worship book of the Old Testament, then you could argue that Revelation is the worship book of the New Testament. So it's no wonder that many songwriters have used the words and themes from Revelation to draw us into worship to God. And in this passage, the theme of worship is not only who God is, his holy, almighty, eternal nature, but also he's worshipped because he's creator of all things. God is the creator of the universe and he's our creator of you and of me. God willed everything into existence. Everything has its existence because God has willed it to exist. You and I only exist because God wills it. Now, that ought to be profoundly humbling. We prize independence, human autonomy, human independence. But really, that's an illusion. There's no one who's not entirely dependent on their creator for everything. Our breath, our bodies, our food our companions, our purpose, our meaning, we only exist because of him and his creation. But that cry of holy, holy, holy reminds us of God's perfection and in contrast reminds us of our imperfection. And one way that imperfection I think is demonstrated is in our desire to dissolve the distinction between the creature and the creator on the one hand we attempt to raise ourselves up to the creator's level whenever we exhibit pride and arrogance and self-governing authority power of autonomy then we are raising ourselves up to the creator's level on the other hand when we seek to reduce god to a controllable and limited creature, then that's the opposite of raising ourselves up. We bring him down. And that's really a form of idolatry. Idolatry is about creating a God who we can control and limit, who we can understand in our own limited capacity, robbing God of his otherliness, and domesticating and subduing him. But we must never forget the distinction between us and our creator. God is our creator. We are his creation and we owe our very existence to him. And he's therefore worthy of our worship because of this alone. And so we are called to lay our crowns, if you like, before uh, the Lord God Almighty. All that we are, all that we owe to him, proclaiming his worth, giving him all the glory, honour and power. And if you were in the service, we'd be now moving into a time of worship, listening to songs and praising God together. Although we won't be able to sing out loud, we can only say in our hearts what really matters. And what's in our hearts is what really matters to God as we bring our worship to him who is worthy of our praise. Let's just pray together. Our God and Father, we thank you for who it is that we come into the presence of. We know uh, that as we proclaim your holiness, we are conscious of our own unholiness but we thank you that there are those represented in heaven who come into your presence because of what christ has done for us we thank you that 
we can proclaim you as worthy of our praise and our worship, our glory and honour and power, because you are the creator of all things. We thank you that because you are our creator, we owe everything to you, our very existence. And because you are our creator, you are the one who we should worship alone. Help us to be those who don't try and raise ourselves up and dissolve the distinction between us and yourself. Help us not to be those who bring you down to our level, but help us to be the ones who bow down in wonder and in awe and in worship at who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen.